Good morning. Uh, wow, we got a packed house here. Uh, although uh, I know we had about 500 people who registered for this, and uh, I was looking out on the lawn last night and saw a lot of people out there very late. So I suspect they'll be coming in in a few minutes. A uh, couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, the heat. Uh, we've asked them to turn up the heat outside because I know it's a little bit chilly. Uh, we'll make that happen for you. Uh, we've also ordered a terrific sunset tonight right over the ocean for everyone. It's going to be beautiful. If you caught the one last night, it was uh, amazing. Uh, we have a great uh, week ahead um, and lots of great news from the Linux Foundation, our projects, our member companies. Uh, I do want to, though, uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, in particular, our attendee reception, uh, Intel, is sponsoring our attendee reception tonight, along with our LF Energy project. Uh, it's going to be amazing, just out on the lawn. Uh, I looked at the weather forecast, and I think the clouds are going to clear, the sun's going to come down. It's going to be an amazing uh, evening. Uh, I also want to thank uh, IBM. IBM, VMware, and uh, Walmart Labs, who are sponsoring our breakfasts and breaks. Uh, and finally, our executive lunch and dinner sponsors, uh, GitLab and CloudBees. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. Again, so the evening reception is going to be just out on the lawn right over here on the Half Moon Bay Golf Links from 545 on. Uh, please come and join us. Uh, there are also going to be lots of evening networking opportunities. So uh, from 5.30 to 7, we have the uh, Oceanside Happy Hour. Uh, and then every night from 8.30 to 10, we're going to have nightcaps and networking on the fire pits and the ocean lawn and all over the place. So uh, please uh, take uh, advantage of that. Um, Everyone is on their own for dinner, but there is a shuttle service to uh, the downtown area from uh, the hotel. So if you want to take advantage of that, uh, please do. Um, and then also, please use our networking application. So we have the Brella networking application. There is the link and the code right there. Uh, please take advantage of it. Uh, we also have a few news announcements that we already announced this week. The Chips Alliance, uh, start, we announced yesterday. This is a new initiative around uh, open chip design, a new security initiative called the Red Team Project, uh, which is helping improve the security of Linux distributions in particular. And then we're proud of one thing, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has reached their 375 uh, member mark. Uh, I don't know if the executive director of CNCF, like, so there's Dan. If you see Dan, he will incessantly tell you how they're the fastest growing open source organization ever. It's actually incredibly annoying. Uh, but uh, congratulations to the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation. So just uh, an amazing amount uh, of, of news uh, all the way around. Uh, and, you know, it kind of culminates from a 2018 where the Linux Foundation itself uh, grew faster than we ever had. It, it was an amazing year. We, we launched more projects than we have in the history of the organization. More people joined the organization uh, than ever. It's just amazing. And I think it, uh, it encapsulates sort of what I want to talk briefly about this morning before I introduce the rest of our amazing speakers for the day. Uh, which is that we are really entering this amazing golden age of open source. Now, having said that, I am certain that I have called it the golden age of open source for at least 15 years, uh, but this time it really is uh, the golden age of open source. Uh, there we go. It's always. Uh, but the, the thing that I thought is interesting about this is, you know, it's 2019, and uh, it's, it's something that we shouldn't all take for granted in terms of the fact that open source is just so wildly successful today. And I started thinking about like, how could I communicate uh, how tough it was in the early days for a lot of the vanguards of open source, particularly in terms of people for where open source intersected with the business world, like how difficult it was in the early days. Like we have so much to be grateful for in terms of standing on the shoulders of giants. The, the Richard Salmons, the Linus Torvalds, the, the people from the Apache Software Foundation, from OSI, who you know, define the meaning and definition of open source, these are real giants. But I kept thinking, like, how can I like, go back and, and kind of get a really concrete way about how challenging 
uh, it has been uh, and how far we have come. And so what I did was I went back and looked at the Red Hat S1. This is the, do the documents you file when you go public, and this was in 1999. So in 1999, Red Hat went public on NASDAQ. It was a big deal. And you have to, when you go public, I, I was part of a company that went public a long time ago, you have to you know, file all these SEC documents, including your S1 statement, which includes uh, not only the upside for the investment opportunity, but then the downside risks. And these are literally verbatim, the risk statements from the Red Hat 1999 uh, S1. And I think it's just so, it's such a great encapsulation of what people were super worried about at, at the time. You know, worried enough to have to disclose it in this regulatory document. The fact that, you know, the business model of open source still wasn't quite proven. Uh, that the open source community itself would react negatively to the concept of, of monetization or business as it relates to open source. Uh, the Red Hat folks were worried that they uh, rely on the support of uh, Linus Torvalds and other uh, prominent Linux developers, which I might add they continue to be worried about to this day. I know that was my laugh line. You didn't even get it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, but uh, again, interesting that the, the competition from Microsoft, the uh, fact that all of this independent code is hard to bring together. It's maintained by all these disparate people around the world. And then they were really worried about intellectual property rights. Uh, these were heady times back then, 1999 to early 2000s. You know, you had sort of this ascendancy of the people figuring out the concept of open source. Uh, Microsoft was running ads in Europe, sort of keying in on these weaknesses that were described in the S1 around fragmentation and the disparate development effort. Uh, SCO, the corporate enemy number one there. Does anyone remember SCO, the Unix company, right? that was essentially uh, bringing litigation against uh, all of these uh, folks claiming that they, they were the true owners of the uh, Linux copyright. You know, we were facing the internet bubble and so on and so forth. Huge challenges, big things that needed to be overcome. And the most amazing part about it now in retrospect 20 years later is just how those obstacles were systematically overcome how far we've come in terms of overcoming all of those risks and turning them into real opportunity. And I think if you look back, history judges it as this amazing, amazing success. I mean, certainly in the case of Linux, uh, we have come a long way. Could advance that slide there. You're just ruining my pacing here. There we go. A really long way until we get to the next slide. Uh, so uh, Linux has really come a long way. I mean, it, it really has eventually come to dominate almost every market that it has entered. Like, it's just amazing to think about. Uh, back in 1999, Red Hat is worried about whether or not the Linux platform as a business concept, as a platform itself, in the wake of this competition was, was even going to succeed. And it has probably succeeded, at least in my case, beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, the Linux Foundation itself has also uh, become very successful and, and uh, a critical part of the tech ecosystem. Uh, today we have over 1,300 members. Uh, many of you are here today. This is our uh, member event. 100% uh, of the Fortune 100 Tech and Telecom. We have thousands and thousands of developers working just on Linux Foundation projects, which are a, a small percentage of, I would argue, an important set of projects, but a small percentage of the overall open source uh, projects that are out there, just creating an amazing value. In 2018, a new company, a new organization joined the Linux Foundation every single day. That same pattern continues into 2019. I think what's really interesting, though, is if you look back in particular over the last couple of years, you just have these great concrete ways that all these challenges that we were all worried about 20 years ago in open source uh, have been overcome. For example, the concern about competition with Microsoft. I mean, certainly that has come completely 180. Uh, many Microsoft, is there people from Microsoft here in the room? David, I see, oh, there we go, I see a bunch of you. Uh, Microsoft has turned from you know, a competitor of Linux to one of the biggest contributors to Linux uh, uh, open source in general in the world. Uh, it is really impressive to see the work that's going on at Microsoft. And Microsoft is putting their money where their mouth is 
Uh, and this is uh, I'll, I'll hat tip to uh, David Rudin and some of the legal team uh, over there at Microsoft, uh, where not only are they big contributors to the open source community and participating in all these projects, but uh, they've also uh, come to help us solve another problem that we were all worried about back in 1999, which was intellectual property concerns around open source. As a signatory to the Open Invention uh, Network's uh, license, I think Keith Bergelt, the CEO of Open Invention Network, is there in the back, uh, we've essentially had peace break out in the IP world of open source. You know, it's a meaningful agreement where uh, Microsoft has agreed to uh, not uh, state claims on, on Linux and, and related technology. And it's not just intellectual property or the fact that Microsoft, uh, we now love you. Uh, it's uh, the, also just the business model itself. And 2018, I think, really culminated how much the business model of open source has proven to be successful. Uh, we like at the Linux Foundation to call this the Torvalds effect, of course, because obviously Linus works at the Linux Foundation. But uh, last year, uh, number one and number four of the largest tech acquisitions were both directly based on uh, technology that Linus uh, had started. Uh, the Red Hat acquisition, $34 billion, one of the largest uh, software acquisitions in history, actually the largest software acquisition in history, and then obviously GitHub, uh, $7.5 billion, just demonstrating the amazing value in clear huge numbers uh, that show just how valuable uh, open source is. Red Hat in particular, are the Red Hat folks in the room here, a few of you? See you around, there we go, Chris. Um, what an amazing, for a company that in 1999 was worried about your business model, 69 straight quarters of growth, like literally hole in one, I mean just this amazing journey. Uh, for an organization. Like, I mean, if that's not a good business model, I don't know what is. Um, but it's not just uh, the uh, two mergers and acquisitions we saw last year, but just lots and lots of amazing outcomes in open source uh, from a business perspective. Uh, you know, I look at just the amount of value that's demonstrated here that is sort of you can measure, right, based on you know, private equity investment and IPO, some kind of M&A. That doesn't even include all the value that's being captured by organizations like Toyota who are using open source to build their automotive cockpit experience or companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, and others who are using open source to power their cloud, right? But none of that is even, none of that value is even captured in here. So we're not talking, I mean, it's far more than $70 billion you know, outside of the IPO and M&A uh, activity uh, that we see here. Um, what's uh, also interesting is the, um, as we talk about M&A, today we are launching an ebook, uh, an open source ebook that uh, you can all get on M&A practices. So uh, for all of you who are involved in open source and are looking at uh, acquiring more open source companies. There was so much M&A activity, uh, we decided to uh, write a book about it. There's a, we, that's why the slides didn't work before. We missed my punchline. All right, anyways. Um, the thing that I wanna talk about today is that at the foundation, one of the things that we talk about all the time is how do you build healthy, robust, sustainable open source ecosystems. And this generally works, sometimes it doesn't. We're gonna talk about that this afternoon. But generally what we wanna do here and what we're working with all of you to achieve is to be the best possible upstream for a commercial downstream so that open source projects can be multi-stakeholder driven. They start with great code, but they don't end there. The code then is created by a robust, diverse group of stakeholders who then use that to create commercial products and services that capture the kind of value I just demonstrated, uh, that then take that uh, technology, uh, create these products services to get profit for their organization or capture value in some other way as a government organization uh, that's reducing cost or a nonprofit that's trying to achieve things for the greater good. Uh, and then people take that value, take those profits, reinvest them back into the open source project, largely in the form of those thousands and thousands of developers who work on the project that create better code, more value, that begets better products and services for all of us, 
more profit, more value, more reinvestment, better products. It's that cycle uh, that we're trying to promote, and that's what really creates this economic sustainability of open source. It's one time where, in seeking profit, we can all collectively benefit at the same time. Where helping yourself is helping others at the same time. And I think that's something that really has proven out historically to be the most effective part of open source. Uh, and doing this requires a lot of work. This is one thing that the foundation is super proud of. The fact that in over many years, we've figured out a process to help these big projects create big sustainable ecosystems. Whether it's hosting events like this or many of the hundreds of developer events we host all over the world that you know, thousands of developers attend, uh, our next uh, big event is going to be the KubeCon, Cloud Native Con in Bar uh, Barcelona. We are expecting 12,000 attendees at that single event. Uh, just amazing. We, I've got to give a shout out to Angela Brown back there and her team at the amazing work they do. They're the ones who got the dirt cheap room rate here at this hotel. Uh, for those of you who got in on our room rate, good for you. For those who didn't, you got to register early next time. You really, really do. Uh, we have a legal team, Mike Dolan, Scott Nicholas, Steve Winslow, and Karen Copenhaver, who are some of the foremost IP minds in the world. They're the ones, yes, that call you up and make sure you've signed your agreements, that the trademark has been properly registered, that the intellectual property, the provenance of the code, the uh, way that we run these organizations is clear so that you can share what you want to share, keep what you want to keep. That is one of the golden tenets of, of open source, allowing people to share in a way that uh, is trustworthy uh, and allows them to uh, build this code very fast. We've trained millions of students at the Linux Foundation to help these projects create value more quickly. Uh, certification is something that we've really focused on, particularly in the last few years. This is solving one of those concerns that Red Hat had in their S1 again about interoperability, cobbling these components together, making sure that, for example, in Kubernetes and their Kubernetes service provider certification platform, you can be assured that whether you're running on one cloud or another, you're using the same uh, consistency across those for Kubernetes and many, many more. We have a whole DevOps team that helps these projects uh, through uh, the, the infrastructure that they host, release management, and more. And then finally, this year in 2019, and you're going to hear uh, more about that today, uh, we are really focused on application security, in particular for these big projects that the world and industry is depending upon. Uh, again, we're going to uh, talk more about that today. But I thought it would be fun uh, to see how Linux Foundation projects are being used uh, in the industry. And this is my favorite thing to show all of you today. Uh, how many people watched the uh, Oscars the other day? Anyone? So uh, the chairman of one of our projects, like three people. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Just this morning is going terribly. <laughs> uh, so one of the, chair the chairman of one of our projects was actually nominated for uh, an academy. He, he, he and his team were nominated for an Academy Award uh, this year uh, for visual effects. They didn't win it. Dang it. Uh, but uh, I, we started an organization called the Academy Software Foundation. Uh, Rob Brito, who was the, the gentleman from uh, Industrial Light and Magic who was nominated for a visual effects uh, Oscar, uh, was such a, a great advocate for the concept of using open source in the film industry. You know, if you look at companies like Lucas, Disney, Pixar, others, they're storytellers. But they tell their story through digital effects through uh, computer graphics and animation. Uh, there's this great story that they tell where the 168 most profitable films ever made, like one through 168, are all CGI and animation driven. 169, I think is the right, something, 160 something. Uh, it, the only live action movie that gets up that uh, high is Mamma Mia, which I actually really liked. It's, just, it's a wonderful film. Uh, but uh, I want to show you just 
when you're trying to explain to someone what open source is and what it's used for and why that collaboration uh, works, sometimes it's a little tricky to explain to somebody who's not super familiar with technology. The following video, I think, does an amazing job of, of doing that. So let me show you the video here. Oops. Creative filmmakers today rely more than ever on engineers and scientists using open source software to help craft fantastic visionary images. Every single part of the filmmaking process is touched by software, and a lot of that software is open source software. Some of the greatest innovations we've seen in the modern era of filmmaking have actually been supported by open source software. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Linux Foundation have created the Academy Software Foundation with support from industry leaders. The Academy Software Foundation exists to provide a great home for open source projects that we as an industry use every day. Two projects the Academy Software Foundation is currently working on are OpenVDB and OpenColorIO. OpenVDB is a volumetric data block format. It is pretty ubiquitous in use. Anytime we have an explosion, it's VDB. Anytime you have clouds, it's VDB. Anywhere where you have a lot of fluid simulation, fireballs, gas flowing across a surface, things that are big. We think there's value in having an organization outside of DreamWorks take responsibility for this. And I think we've already seen a benefit in that, that we've had other studios step forward in a way they had not previously with contributions to the standard. OpenColorO is an open source color management solution for motion picture production. End to end, everyone working on a show, from an artist at a workstation to a director in a theater, can see the same image and speak the same visual language. OpenColorO is compatible with ACES and can be used to implement any well-defined color standard. Highly critical projects need oversight, particularly for more than one studio or company, and can benefit greatly from not only the shared development resources, but also the solid infrastructure offered by the Linux Foundation and their involvement in the Academy Software Foundation. Whether you are a user of open source software, or an engineer, or a company that relies on open source software, we want to create the right ecosystem for you to get the most out of the open source software that you need to use. Find us at aswf.io and join the mailing list and see how you can get involved. Pretty impressive, right? So a couple quick notes on that. The narrator, the woman you hear at the beginning, she, that's literally the voice of the Oscars, uh, which is so amazing. I mean, like, for our open source projects, A, to describe an open source project as like anytime, anytime anything explodes in a movie, that's OpenVDB is, is awesome. Uh, to have Thanos and uh, you know Spider-Man in a promotional video for an open source project, I don't think it's ever been done. Uh, I mean, think about it. The, the, you know, Linux, all, all they have is Tux, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm talking Thanos here, right? Like destroying half of the universe, right? Uh, to their credit, CNCF, uh, they have Fippy and friends. <laughs> Not quite the same. Um, and then, but the, so probably some, one of the, our networking projects are a good example. They have these really difficult to understand architectural <laughs> diagrams, like nobody gets, right? Uh, but here's one thing that, that is interesting, is uh, our networking projects, and I think this is easy to understand, the open network automation platform is being used to do something that I think is easy to understand. Check out this video of how open source software is being used to orchestrate uh, a network that's saving people's lives. Let's, let's roll this video. FirstNet is one of those opportunities to make a fundamental difference in every public safety responder's approach to managing emergencies. You've got agencies converging onto one central geographic location. Communication and getting resources where they need to be is a challenge. By no fault whatsoever of the individuals that are there responding to the scene, it's the technology that they had available to them. They're trying to coordinate a disastrous mass chaos. This is when the network gets bogged down. And they can't communicate with one another because the system was not set up to do so. The technology that they've used to this point really pales in comparison to what we're going to provide them on FirstNet. Teenager, we need to put on a search. This individual is missing. This is their potential location. And then we can call for a helicopter to have live infrared searching for an individual. 
chapter. Take your guys now. Communications between agencies and among agencies. Always talking, always up on the network, always using the data. Live in real time. I need everybody inside. Keep the communication open, please. So we can search quicker, we can find people quicker, and then as soon as we find a victim, we can get them extricated, triaged, treated, transported to the hospital. You're okay now. Take him out first, he's really hurt. We're putting tools in their hands that they can see what's happening around them and react to it in a way that saves lives. I'm really proud to be part of something that's going to revolutionize public safety. We're going to take really good care of them. Thank AT and T, powered by open source, the open network. There's the architecture. It's it's somewhere in there. <laughs> um, but you know, re really, really impressive that uh, open source is being used to do all these amazing things. You would have never thought 20 years ago. Uh, I'm also happy to report that uh, one of our other projects, the Yocto project, is being used in space. Uh, so this is uh, from Yocto. It's an embedded Linux uh, distribution. It's a build tool for that. Uh, and this is being used on a satellite that currently is in the vicinity of Mars. I think this goes on the record for uh, the farthest distance a Linux system has ever traveled into space. So we want to call that out in 2019. Uh, our Hyperledger project is being used uh, in supply chain management uh, to help people and to reduce exploitation. Uh, tantalum is something that you've got in your pockets right now. It's a rare earth element that's used to create transistors uh, in smartphones and laptop. Uh, our Hyperledger Fabric project is being used to manage uh, the supply chain of this rare earth element to make sure that we know where it came from and that it doesn't come from places where you have child exploitation, slave labor, uh, and others. So we're not only you know, helping making uh, the world a safer place in disaster recovery situations, but helping supply chains be honest and transparent. Even more than that, here's another project at the foundation that I'm super happy to be associated with. Is Josh in the audience somewhere here? Josh from Let's Encrypt, I saw him somewhere. There he is. When Josh and I first met, uh, we, we were talking about how uh, he wanted to create this free certificate authority that was super easy for people to use to encrypt internet uh, and web traffic. Just apt get let's encrypt, install it, it's free, it's awesome. At the time, I think the amount of HTTPS page loads in the US was like 40%, something like that. Uh, and now it's up to 87%. Right? And then, you know, Let's Encrypt is now the world's largest certificate authority and has had a meaningful impact on all of our collective security and privacy. Drone Code, another Linux Foundation project, has clocked more flight hours than any aerospace company this year. Uh, they are down in Tijuana flight testing every day, putting in code revisions, figuring out how to do this. Uh, it is an impressive operation. Uh, they're working with regulators to use that code and those clock all those flight hours to uh, draw conclusions about uh, the future of drone technology in the United States. And speaking of drones, it doesn't stop there. Another Linux Foundation project, Automotive Grade Linux, is being used uh, the, for the onboard operating system for uh, the uh, Daimler, for the Mercedes uh, drones and vans, vans and drones delivery vehicles, right? So these are vehicles that go around and a drone comes out through the roof of the car and delivers packages. Drones don't stop there. Uh, our Zephyr real-time operating system project also participated in the Super Bowl halftime show uh, this, this year. Uh, with the drones uh, Pepsi Sugar Halftime Show, if you saw that. So all of this stuff powered by open source is amazing to see how far we've come. But for as far as we have come, uh, I think we still have a long way to go. And that's what I want to talk about uh, this afternoon. After we listen to our speakers this morning who have amazing news about new projects at the LF, lots of exciting things they're doing, for everything we were worried about back in 1999, the amazing accomplishments over 20 years for open source, we still have a long way to go. I think it's important now, here at this event, with leaders in open source and the industry, to confront 
some of the tough problems around open source. The first one I think we can all agree on is application security. Application security continues to be an issue for all forms of software, and open source is obviously a critical part of the software ecosystem. We see vulnerabilities that are exploited on a regular basis, whether it's Equifax or Heartbleed or things like that, where uh, vulnerable code, bugs in software are exploited to expose the private data or worse of people all over the world. And if you look, you know, SNCC did a recent survey where open source maintainers are telling us we need help, that they're getting better at application security, but it's just not enough. Uh, one in four open source maintainers does not audit their code base. Uh, even worse, and I think this is one of the toughest things, is just the number of vulnerabilities found in open source as open source increases in popularity and in the sheer amount continues to increase at a very, very fast pace. We need to collectively do something about application uh, security. And it's not just application security. There are important open source projects that lack resources, funding, and resources to help make those projects better. You know, if you talk to open source developers, they get frustrated that they're doing kind of all this work that, you know, the people think, oh, you know, hardware's something you have to pay for, but like, you know, I can just create all this stuff for, for free. Uh, there's a gentleman right here in the front row, Mark. Uh, you can relate to this statement. You know, who can do all this stuff, you know, maintain this for free? You know, often in a, in a uh, GitHub repo, you have people who just fly by and expect commercial support from somebody who's maintaining a code base essentially for free. Uh, there are these awesome Twitter feeds that I see all the time about like stuff maintainers here. Uh, you know, hey, can you just, I, I have to do this for a product, I mean, can you just apply this patch or release a little bit earlier for me uh, and, and just are, are not uh, ponying up anything for that. Uh, the final thing that I think is a, a meaningful problem that we need to be introspective about and, and help uh, is the shortage of diversity in our communities. Um, it's just an obvious fact. I think that uh, in 2017, uh, the, one of the most recent surveys about uh, gender in, in a large group of open source uh, communities, just these numbers are, are not good, right? I think we all are aware of the issue. I think everybody agrees that diverse communities are strong communities. I mean, there's just academic study after academic study about how Diversity creates better outcomes. This is something that is a challenge that we all need to collectively work on. So for as far as we have come, the challenge that I want to have everybody think about the entire week you're here, how can we create better application security? How can we get more resources into the developers' hands, that we, the developers who we depend on? And how can we create more diversity in these communities? And as a part of that, this afternoon, the Linux Foundation has some new ideas. I'm not just gonna get up here and complain about things. Uh, we've been working for quite some time on some solutions that we can think, uh, that we think can help improve all of these things. And this afternoon, we're gonna introduce you to something new uh, that we uh, think will solve all of these challenges. Uh, so, you know, any organization like ours or any of all of yours, every once in a while needs to think of new ways to approach and solve problems. And I wanted to show one last clip from a Super Bowl uh, a series of advertisements that IBM launched way back when, when we were worried about all these things. And I think it's time for us to take the advice of the gentleman in this video about how we can change once again. Shake things up. Shake up the world. So that was from maybe 16, 17 years ago, uh, IBM ran these iconic set of ads uh, that showed this little child who was sharing knowledge with folks like Muhammad Ali and others that was gonna change the world. I think it's time for us to 
shake things up again, and we've got some interesting stuff this afternoon. So with that, I want to thank you for listening to me for an extended period of time, uh, and I want to introduce uh, our next speaker.